we're fortunate now to be speaking with Peter Noon, who is a, a legend in his own right because he was part of the British invasion that came over uh, back in 1964-65 period. Peter, how are you? I'm very good. You now are with a new group. I'm now with a band called The Tremblers, and we just got our first album since Herman's Hermits in 1969. So That's great. That's good to hear. It's, uh, it's nice. You know, it's very interesting. A lot of uh, artists are coming back. Roy Orbison is back on the charts again. You've come out with a new group again, and I, I think this is great. It's very interesting to see groups coming back like this. Well, it, it's not really coming back because I, Roy Orbison's still called Roy Orbison. I used to be Herman. Now I'm just one part of the Tremblers. I'm 20% of the band. I think that I'm more than that, but I have to say that I'm 20% of the band. Well, I'd have to think that you are a little more because I noticed uh, on your first album you wrote all but one song on the album. Yeah, that's because I've got the loudest voice. You know, when it comes to those democracies, it's always the person who speaks loudest. Oh, okay. That's very interesting. And I produced it as well. You see, the producer always gets to choose the song, so I chose all my own. Therefore, you're a little more than 20%, we'd have to say. Well, I'm 100% the producer, you see, which That's is cheating right. slightly. Let's go back a little bit uh, to the 60s. Now, you were a group over in uh, England called the Heartbeats originally, as I recall. Well, the first band I was in, uh, when I was 12, there was a school band you know, called the Cyclones, and we used to just, we had one amplifier and no microphones, so we only did instrumentals. We used to do Shadows, Ventures, Johnny and the Hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, over the years, the, the Cyclones fell to pieces because one of the guys wanted to be a hairdresser or something very bizarre like that. And he, we were rehearsing in his mother's house so then I went looking for other guys and we found this this guy had a van so he became the bass player mm -hmm. and another guy had a PA so he became the guitar player and I became the singer because the, the next band was called the Heartbeats and we did only Buddy Holly songs and I used to play the piano and the guitar but I, the singer had to go to the front and pretend he was Buddy Holly I see so that became me and we became Pete Novak and the Heartbeats okay and then in 64 we'd been going for about two or three years like locally around Manchester and Liverpool and Blackburn and then in 64 we changed our name we originally changed it to Sherman and the Shermits Sherman and the Hermits because we'd seen the Bullwinkle show and there was this guy in it called Sherman and Professor Peabody <laughs> and as I wore these Buddy Holly fake glasses with no glass in them because I was a Buddy Holly impersonator mm -hmm. what happened was that people said I looked like the Sherman from the Bullwinkle show so we had these cards you know uh, Sherman's Hermits Bar Mitzvah's Weddings mm -hmm. Your Sister's uh, Birthday Party kind of thing and my phone number Ermston 6751 and the the printer of the cards we ordered 5,000 and they forgot the first S on I'll be darn. So that's how we got the name. We became Herman's Hermits. That's interesting. You know, I always thought that it was uh, probably the result of uh, your producers or uh, whomever oh, was no. the backers. No, we were, we were around for years before. What happened was when we finally got a record deal, it was because the Beatles had left town and Jerry and the Pacemakers had had hits and Billy J. Kramer, all, all our local people at the same time had gone. All the people who started at the same time had all, were all superstars. Mm -hmm. And we were still there and all the labels were looking for somebody else to kind of replace it. So we had a choice of, uh, like, we could go with EMI, which was Capital, or we could go with CBS. And I wanted to be with, I'd seen a Rolling Stones, an Everly Brothers Rolling Stones tour, mm -hmm. where everyone booed the Rolling Stones, so I became a fan, right? And uh, there was a guy on it who started it, a guitar player called Mickey Most, who opened for the Stones. It was Mickey Most, the Stones, and the Everly Brothers. And I really liked him because he did all rock and roll songs. Mm -hmm. He did Eddie Cochran, Summertime Blues and things like that. So I phoned him up and asked him, did he want to produce the band? 
So he said, yeah, he'd love to. He came to Manchester. We paid his playing fare because he was broke and all that stuff. And he came and he produced the band. And he was the British, was the greatest producer of all time. Mickey Through Moss. you, then, uh, is where Mickey Moss became uh, a producer well, and actually had a stable of artists that was he'd, he'd gigantic. Done one, he'd done one record by The Animals, which wasn't a big hit. I can't remember their first single. It wasn't House of the Rising Sun. Mm -hmm. It was one before that, which was a Bob Dylan song. Mm -hmm. And it had been a small hit, so I knew he could produce records. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, he, once we got him involved and we made the record, we got a very good deal for a new band. We got a better deal than the Beatles. That's great. That's interesting. Now, it's also interesting, you say that you were a fan of the Rolling Stones also, and yet probably because of groups like the Animals and the Rolling Stones, this had to help your popularity. And the way I'm thinking about this is that parents had to like you a little more than the image that the stones and the animals put out there so they probably said this is great to their kids well what happened was that you know when you're 15 years old you can't go in bars and get drunk and things like that and True. the stones could you know so i was so young and i think that the parents liked it but i think i was especially lucky because i was the same age as my audience at the time you know so i knew what I would go to, I would do a show, say, here at the War Memorial, and then the following night in New York, I would go and see a band that I liked, and not, not scream, obviously, because I, I couldn't scream, it would spoil my throat. So, I was like a fan of other people, so I understood my fans, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I could figure it out that they were excited for the the right reasons, you know. Right. You know, that is interesting because uh, Jerry and the Pacemakers had been around for a while. Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas had been around. The Beatles were a little older. I think other than you, the Searchers had to be the youngest group, and they were still older also. I was, everybody was in the 20s except for me. I was right. 15, and every, all the Beatles were in the 20s. The Stones were in the 20s. Billy was in his sure. 20s. Sure. So I was like the first kind of teeny bopper singer. Uh -huh. So it was good, you know, because I could go out and be a fan of other bands as well as being in a band that was making it. Right. Whereas normally 15-year-old boys just get to watch. Uh -huh. I was up there doing it. Well, that's great. Now, the first hit that uh, made it big in America was uh, something that Carole King and Jerry Goffin had mm -hmm. written, uh, an old Earl Jean tune, uh, I'm Into Something Good. Now that was successful as a cover for you, and you had a couple of others that were very successful, Silhouettes and uh, Wonderful World. You mentioned that you did a lot of Buddy Holly. Why, why didn't you ever cover a, a Buddy Holly thing? Well, we did, but they never turned out to be quite so good as that, you know, because he did them so well. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, he did them. They still sound quite good to the, I mean, they still sound like very well-made records, because mm -hmm. that Norman Petty, that whole thing, they were well-made records. And we did... What happened was that in England, we had... There was no radio in England. We could only get American radio. We used to get American Forces Network from Germany. You know, my dad had a big aerial in the garden. Because mm -hmm. he liked... He was a bit of a music freak as well. And BBC only played Vera Lynn and things like that. So we would listen to American songs before English people heard them, you know, and Herman's Hermit's Act, before we made it, was like, we used to do Mother-in-Law, Ernie K. Doe, which sure. recorded Heartbeat, uh, Silhouettes, Wonderful World, all songs that we eventually recorded were part of our stage act mm -hmm. as we grew up. Because there were 50 songs mostly. Right. There you did mention a Buddy Holly song, Heartbeat. Yeah. Which well, that's a, where we got uh, the name of the first band as well, the Heartbeats. I'll be darned. And we just did Buddy Holly songs. That's I mean, great. that's all we did, Buddy Holly songs. We used to go on and do all of the choral collection. Mm -hmm. And I could really copy them good. You know, I had the glasses and the, sh the leg used to go just like on Ed Sullivan show. Well, you know that Buddy Holly uh, was far more a legend in... In Europe England. and England yeah. than he was here until just recently when I guess Linda Ronstadt started bringing his songs back. Yeah, and then they moved them, made the movie and then sure. Paul McCartney found himself getting richer by the sure, second. Sure, but uh, people like Gene Vincent, Eddie Cochran, Buddy Holly were far bigger in England. Gene Vincent's, Gene Pitney is still a big star. Is that right? And it just shows you Roy Orbison, they do if you, there's no English act who does more business than Roy Orbison be in England. 
I'll be darned. Money, dollar-wise, do you yeah, know what I mean? If he great. wants to do a tour, he can work to 10,000 people every night for a year. Wow, that's something else. Yeah. Now, you guys were extremely successful. You had over 20 chart records in America, of which over 10 of them made the top 10 here. Uh, did you have any inkling that this would stop, or did you wonder if it would continue forever? I knew it was going to stop because the band were a 60s band and the, uh, the 70s were coming. I mean, I mean, Herman's Hermit should have been put to rest on December the 31st, 1969, mm -hmm. because it was a 60s band. The operation was set up to deal with the 60s. Right. And there was no way it could move on. It, the name was wrong once uh, Flower Power and Acid Rock came in. The sure. name was, everything was wrong about it. Sure. So the, I decided to do nothing. To do nothing is always better than to make a big mistake. Uh huh. You lasted as a group till about the end of '71, somewhere in there. We got together for one tour in '73. Uh huh. And we did great business. We sold out Madison Square Gardens, which we couldn't do when we were hot. I'll be darned. It was funny. We used to do nine, ten thousand. Was and it part of a revival? Yeah, right. That was the last ever gig with Herman. That was the last time anyone was allowed to call me Herman on stage. That, that's interesting, I'll tell you. Because I was, I was nervous that, you know, I saw that Chubby Checker had done the same thing. And he, for poor old Chubby, he might have great creative energy, but he's always going to be stuck with the twist and let's twist again. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, imagine me, I'm 22 years old. I'm always going to have to be the guy who did Mrs. Brown, and I won't ever be able to allow be allowed to do hen anything except for those two songs. Yeah, yeah, which we don't want to happen, really, because uh, they they are classic hits, but those are hits. I think that uh, people hear those once or twice, and that's all they want to hear them now. Yeah, whereas right. some of the other songs uh, were were. Great songs. Like No Milk Today. That's There's right. No Milk Today is a real great song. Yeah, right. And it's a good, well-made record. Right. And we had, we by then we were getting really good musicians on the record. It's like Jimmy Page on guitar, John mm -hmm. Paul Jones on bass. We became Led Zeppelin. Right. Right. You know, we so did a, uh, uh, we do something on our Glory That Was Grace show called a reissue comparison. We did the Earl Jean thing and yours. Uh, about two weeks ago and people wrote in and said gee uh, first of all a lot of people didn't know that Earl Jean had done it but it was refreshing to hear the song again yeah so, it's uh, a good little song yeah, isn't it yeah it is August the 7th 1964 that came out okay I'm, I'm glad it came out because obviously that was a start in America for our knowing Peter Noon and Herman and his hermits now right. tell us about Peter Noon and the Tremblers now well it's not Peter Noon and the Tremblers it's the Tremblers I don't want to cash in on my name because my name is known and I'd rather the band started right at the bottom and grew up as a, a good band you know, mm -hmm. we got our first album out our first single comes out this week's called Steady Eddie Steady Eddie right now let me tell you about Steady Eddie okay all right this is my feeling concerning Steady Eddie. When I first heard the record, I immediately thought of Eddie Cochran's guitar, and You're that's right. no lie. Exactly. Well, well, that's where it came from. Mm -hmm. You know, it was from, uh, you know, I, it, in fact, the chords are the same as in a Steady Eddie, uh, as an Eddie Cochran song. I won't tell you which one, but what happened was I went into the studio with the Heartbreakers, mm -hmm. you know, Tom Petty's band, and I had this idea, and I wanted to just have one, like Eddie Cochran's first records, he mm -hmm. played everything on those oh, records. He, was he played great the drums, too. the bass, the, all the guitars, and just overdubbed them in bathrooms and things. And I wanted to make that kind of record, but Mike Campbell from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, the mm -hmm. guitar player, said, hey, why not let's try this lick? And the lick fitted exactly with, with my chords, which were Eddie Cochran's chords. And the whole song is, I mean, Eddie, Steady Eddie, Eddie Cochran. I'll be darned. See, I was just taking kind of a guess on that, but that's really interesting. Yeah, and there's and there's another song in the Tremblers album called "Dad Said," which is a uh, is like, it's like a, my version of summertime blues mm -hmm. because his dad said you can't use the car because you didn't work late. Right. And my dad said other things like put down that guitar and do something with your hands, which mm -hmm. always I, I always think thought that was very funny at the time. I looked at him for about five minutes, put down that guitar and. Do something with your hands. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's good. You know, it's. I had read that uh, uh, we got a, a little liner note 
the, the letter that you would compose, and you said uh, this is kind of a tribute to Eddie Cochran on the Dad Said thing. Yeah. But I had played side one first, and really, when I first heard those licks, I said, boy, that sounds like Eddie Cochran. Now yeah, there's... Like, uh, da -da -da -da. Right, da -da -da. right. Yeah, right. There's another cut on uh, side one. It's the fifth cut, and I'm trying to think of the name... Uh, it's something uh, loving uh, little lover little lover okay that one believe it or not reminds me of a fellow that's just starting out pretty well now called uh, Johnny Burnett he just really? had a hit called tying a tone tired of tone the line right, I know that song and that's the kind of uh, that's close to rockabilly that cut it's well you know where it that, came uh, that one came from it's a mixture of uh, you remember a guy called big bopper and he goes sure. uh, you know what i like mm -hmm. well i i've used that in little lover as well it was just my idea I, w when i first wrote the song it, they're the most famous rock and roll songs they're the first three chords i ever learned to play mm -hmm. and that gave me access to all those songs all eddie cochran songs all buddy holly eab you got it sure right? even the stones all their songs are e a and b so what happened was that I originally was going to have the back the 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 lick from shaking all over dang, dang, dun, 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 in the background, mm -hmm. plus the lick from Dizzy Miss Lizzy mm -hmm. in the background, and they're in there. If you listen to them very carefully, they didn't get completely erased. All those licks are in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. But in the end, we ch we changed it and just used the lick that I wrote you, which is dun, 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 right. sideways. Right. Well, I like the way you sing that one uh, very much too. The, you you really go all out. It's a, you know, your feeling is right behind that. Uh, I enjoy it very much, and and I I think that uh, if you look at music today, uh, a lot of it is based on the music of the fifties once again. Well, I think all you see all my roots, even though I'm not old enough to be in into 50s music you know I didn't really I was born in 47 mm -hmm. so I don't know a lot about 50s music only what I heard on American Forces Network and those are the kind of records that I got my that's my roots that's the Stones roots they'll tell you straight sure. away you know the Beatles were, mm -hmm. were, were access most of the Beatles roots were from country and western music because mm -hmm. we didn't know that that what we heard on the radio wasn't always rock and roll. You see, in England, we didn't know that R&B was only supposed to be for black people. Mm -hmm. and country and Western people were only supposed to be people who lived on farms. It all sounded like rock and roll. I was really disappointed when I went to see Johnny Cash sure. and found that he wasn't a rock and roll singer. Sure. And that he did all ballads. I thought all he did was uh, I walked, I walked the line, the line you know. ballad, of, ballad then, of teenage queen. And then like I that. That, then I'd go to Nashville and they'd say I'd see the Grand Old Opry or something, and I'd go in there and there'd all these be strange people with piano accordions and things, and then they'd bring on like my hero, you know, like the guitar player heroes from then, as country and western stars, not rock and roll stars. Right. See, we didn't know. We didn't. We weren't smart enough to realize that there was M O R A O R P O R G O R. We just called it rock and roll, you know, mm -hmm. music. So we, I mean, the, one of the songs, the most successful song that Herman Hermits ever did on stage before we broke, before we had hits, was "The End of the World." Oh which yeah, was Skeeter, Skeeter Davis, Davis, you know, and we copied it almost exactly as as she'd done, you know. I tried to sing it like she did. You did put that on an album, though, didn't you? Yeah, I think it was on our first or second album. Right. And we just, you know, that was our roots. You know, we didn't know that was country and western. We thought that was a ballad. Mm -hmm. We also did Bobby Rydell's I'll Never Dance Again, which wasn't a big hit for him, but used to kill on Good stage. Good song, yeah. Yeah, took no prisoners. Barry Mann, Cynthia Well, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was Carol King. No, I think it was Marilyn Wilde. Yeah, it was. I'm pretty sure See, that's where a lot of my influence even now came from those writers of that period late 50s early 60s carol king jerry goffin man and wild uh Palmer schumann because they were so amazing and they never did they weren't extraordinarily different each song wasn't so much different from the other ones if you could play one you could play them all mm -hmm. they had a theory that worked for about 10 years 
and believe it or not, a lot of them are still writing and coming out with things sure again. Are. So Barry Mann just wrote that "Here You Come Again," that's yeah, right, which is a great song. You've lost that loving feelings a hit again. Mm -hmm. And of course, Carol King is doing her own thing and doing it very well. But you, some of her old songs are absolute dynamite. We mm -hmm. did one song which was never released in America called "Show Me Girl," which was a great Carol King song. Mm. See, I used to collect her demos. When I was a little kid, I used to go to, um, like, Screen Gems Music in London. Mm -hmm. And I knew a girl who worked there, and she used to steal demos for me. Carol King's, I had this big collection of all her demos. I'll be done. You know, she used to put them on a tape. There were no cassettes in those days, and she used to put them on a tape. And she'd go into the acetate room after, after night, you know, after the shop had closed. And make me cassettes, four songs uh, on uh, acetates, four songs wow. on acetate. Wow, I'll be darned. So I've got this great collection. I go into Screen Gems now in New York and Los Angeles and I say, Why have you got a copy of that song? They say, What song? We've never heard that song. I said, You don't know that? Carol King, she wrote it in 62. It was with Carol King and uh, How uh, Howard Greenfield. They say, Wow, where's that song? And eventually they find that they do have this great song in their catalogue. That's great. That's I know more about them, about, more than they do about their I artists. I think that's great. Okay, now the Tremblers are on uh, Johnston Records. Yeah, that's Bruce Johnston. Mm -hmm. What happened was we were... I, I was going into the studio making tracks for the Tremblers and we were called the Dominators. Mm -hmm. We were called the Dominators. And um, we were... Who's that knocking on the door? We were going into the studio making tracks for the court for this Dominators, and I went to a party at Bruce. Bruce had a party for Brian Wilson because mm -hmm. Brian was coming back in the band and everything, and I played my tape there, you know, just to get some reaction. I didn't say who it was or anything, and Bruce said, "I want you on the label. I'm going to get you a deal on CBS." So I said, "Okay, here's the cassette Dominators written on it. Mm -hmm. If you can get me a deal without mentioning my name." I'll be on your label. Great. So he went in the following morning and they called me Epic, we want to sign you. That's great. So I said, well, you know, I'm Peter Noon, I used to be in Herman's Hermits, and they said, wow, that's great. Mm -hmm. So I said, you can't mention it in the, in the title. Eventually we had to change the name because people would have thought we'd come on in with leather and whips and things, you know, the Dominators. It was all wrong for the band. Okay. Now you toured with the Beach Boys uh, this past summer, and now you're touring on your own with the band. Yeah, right. What we did was we, 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 we were lucky. The Wilson brothers liked the Tremblers tape before it was released. And they asked us, would we tour with them? And it was ridiculous because we didn't sell one ticket. We were unknown. The record wasn't out even, you know. Mm -hmm. So we just went on this tour and did 11 songs and got some friends, you know, made friends in the audience. Great. And then as soon as we finished that one, we had four days off in Los Angeles and then we started on our own tour. Mm -hmm. But we just do little clubs now. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're happy you're back on the scene. Well, it's nice to be back. We appreciate your coming by very much. Thank you very much. I liked it. I enjoyed that. Very good. Thank you. All right.